Okay then, guys. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm assuming you can. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining. I think the numbers are still rising a little bit, so we're going to try and extend this out before the first speaker so everyone can make sure they get in. Uh, first of all, I thought I'd start off with a few reasons why, why I really wanted to do this. And I think it probably stems back to some of the some of the things that I was witnessing and, and watching really. I was watching a lot of webinars and I thought they were brilliant, really, really informative. But what I didn't feel like was the fact that you couldn't really have much of an interactive conversation with the with the presenters. So I wanted to do this. So there was a panel of people and there was also someone presenting, giving different people from different backgrounds a present a chance to present. And then also the chance to even for people to discuss that wouldn't get usually a chance to discuss. Now, it, over the first few days, I quickly realized that it wasn't going to be exactly how I wanted it to be because a lot of people decided that they wanted to join and it kind of spiraled a little bit out of control. But I feel like we've got a good grip on it. We've got some great panelists and some even better and some even better um, discussioners. So there we're, we're hoping for some good, good discussions and really, really, really good um, presentations as well. First of all, I hope that your friends, families, and colleagues are well. Stay home, stay safe. I even try and use this period to try, to try something new. For example, I've never ever set up a webinar or a journal club online with this many people. I wanted to use this opportunity to try something that I've never done before and see how it goes. A huge thank you to all the NHS staff, key workers during the time. They're the ones that are keeping this country going. A quick overview of the event. So first of all, this is the introduction from me in the first five minutes. Then we're going to go on to the speakers and discussers. Informal discussion of the panelists, and that's going to probably topic in and around the COVID-19, how we're all going to really, also going to try and resume training to what we feel like we can actually do. And there's a few updates that have came in the past, in the coming day, uh, the previous days, which when the seasons could potentially start again and when we when we could actually start back training. An event close and thanks. So I've sort of covered it so far, but I feel like with this, it's to give a lot of a lot of different people some a chance to present from a lot of different backgrounds. So we have, first of all, we have Dr. Harry Routledge. Harry's worked in Australia at Port Adelaide, an AFL club. He's worked at the Premier League, and he's also worked with. Um, he's also worked most recently with LAFC. Then you've got Kevin Shattuck, who is a doctoral researcher at Leeds Beckett University, and he is doing his. Uh, he is doing his doctoral research with Harrogate, Harrogate Town Rugby. And then we have Professor Barry Druss, who I'm sure many of you know. He's had a wealth of experience both in the applied and academic field. He's published over 120 research papers. So I'm sure that everyone's going to be really interested in what he's got to say and how he sort of dissects a research paper before he applies it into the real world. So first up, we've got Dr. Harry Routledge now. I'm just going to try. Well, firstly, thank you, Liam, for the invitation to, to discuss this paper today. Um, this is one of the papers from my PhD thesis, and it was it's had a bit of an impact, I suppose you could say, um, around the assessment of muscle glycogen within elite athletes and our ability to be able to potentially measure muscle glycogen non-invasively. So the title of the paper, as you've all seen, is the uh, is ultrasound does not detect acute changes in glycogen in the vastus lateralis of man. So firstly, and sort of the rationale behind the paper is, is why is the measurement of muscle glycogen important? So we know that the measure, the measure of muscle glycogen within athletic populations is not readily available due to the invasive nature of, of muscle biopsy. But taking that step further, it's been established that high carbohydrate availability improves both endurance and high intensity intermittent exercise performance. So that ranges from over from marathon runners to, to team-based athletes and as such the practice of carbohydrate loading to supercompensate muscle glycogen stores in the days immediately before competition remains the cornerstone of sports science practices that's not 
it's not groundbreaking in any in any sense and we all know that but it's the ability to try and measure that to allow us to better understand our athletes and how they're they're fueled for performance which is which is the key so some rationale around why we why we did this study and why we did this research there was a paper in 2015 indicating that a non-invasive assessment tool of muscle glycogen using ultrasound was 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 out there and was and had been researched and had been shown that <clears throat> had been shown via some or following some cycling bout of exercise so as you can see on this slide when you've got the darker pockets of darker pockets on on the image that's indicating a an in, uh, an heightened level of glycogen storage and then if we take figure three you can see that there's there's an increase in grayscale which is more white pockets indicating that there's been some depletion of glycogen. Now, the premise of this is that the ultrasound system is measuring the water content of the muscle under the premise that at least three grams of water are stored for each gram of glycogen in the muscle. So if we can use the, this ultrasound technique to measure the images as shown, then we can measure muscle glycogen per se. So Taking an ultrasound score and muscle biopsies together, following a bout of cycling exercise, um, Hill and Milan in 2014 showed some, some really positive data highlighting that with a change in muscle glycogen, there was a positive correlation with a change in ultrasound score, indicating that when you see a change in, in, in glycogen following an acute bout of exercise, you see a corresponding change in the ultrasound score. This was taken on further by Neiman in 2015, who also showed that following a 75 kilometer cycling bout of exercise not only is there a significant decrease in muscle glycogen pre or post but again you say you see a positive correlation between the change in muscle glycogen and the change in ultrasound score so that was the rationale behind why we decided to, to, to do this study and, and take it on but the the first part we had to had to really understand is is the actual technique reproducible in nature is it is it highlighting or is it showing something that it can test retest? So is it, is it reproducible in its, in its ability to measure? So initially in study one, we did a test retest in hundred subjects, 60 minutes apart without the ingestion of food or water. And as you can see on the image on the left, subjects are in a supine, supine position. We decided to, to investigate this across three muscles mainly, the vastus lateralis, the rectus femoris and the vastus medialis. And we wanted to do it across different muscle lengths to identify which aspects or which part of the, which muscle and which, which length was the most reproducible. So you can see by the images on the left, these were the, the locations and that was 25% of uh, 50, 25%, 50% and 75% of the muscle length. We also looked at the vastus medialis and, and as you'll see in the, the following slide, that, that wasn't very, that wasn't an, a location that was reproducible in nature due to a lot of other landmarks within that region. So what did our data, what, what did the data show us? It showed us that at 50% of the vastus lateralis, 50% of the vastus lateralis is the most reproducible location for performing an ultrasound technique to measure muscle glycogen. And we did some reproducibility stats, as you can see on there. So once we understood that the 50% of the VL was the most reproducible site, the next question was, if this is going to have application in the real world, can we are we able to take it into a real world setting? And is it able to detect changes pre to post? Now, the, our second question was, is this technique able to detect changes in muscle glycogen pre to post a rugby league game? So, from the methodology standpoint, uh, 60 minutes prior, prior to the game, following a, a carbohydrate load, subjects had a ultrasound scan taken at 50% of the VL and a muscle biopsy. The game was played and post game within 40 minutes, there was a muscle biopsy taken and an ultrasound scan taken at the same location. And as you can see in the following image, you've got the, the strap in there is where the muscle biopsy was taken and the, the black cross is where the ultrasound scan was done. And that's been taped over to reduce it, any, any sort of wear and tear and, and removing of that mark to ensure that the same location was, was used each time. So from a muscle glycogen standpoint from the biopsies, we saw a significant decrease pre to post game as you would, as you would expect to see. But then taking the ultrasound score, pre to post game, there was no significant difference. And even on the individual changes, 
from an individual from a subject from an individual subject standpoint. As you can see, there some some subjects actually increased on the Upjam score when we know that they decrease from a from a muscle glycogen standpoint. And if we take the same analysis that was done in the previous studies, looking at the change in Upjam score and the change in muscle glycogen, we actually see a negative correlation as as previously shown a positive. Now, that wasn't saying that it definitely it definitely wasn't able to to measure muscle glycogen, but we we suspected that it could produce a different some some different um, some different elements. So with the contractile nature and the and the intermittent stimuli of rugby league and also the the contact nature of it, was that potentially having an, an effect on information around where the, the ultrasound site was taken? We know that the ultrasound system is assessing water content. So if is the is intermittent nature and the and the contact of rugby league affecting that so having acquired that data we then decided to take it back to the lab and decide and investigate in a rested muscle so we saw that following immediately post the game when the muscle is under trauma and there's potential potentially some fluid shifts in there if we take it in a rested muscle are we able to then therefore see a change in ultrasound score and muscle glycogen so the third part of, the, of this paper and the, the third study within the paper is, and the question we're asking is, in states of high and low muscle glycogen availability, can the ultrasound method detect chip differences in arrested muscle? So from a methodology standpoint, uh, subjects would arrive at, at day one in both conditions and have a pre-ultrasound scan. Then there'd be a glycogen depletion protocol and then a post, post the depletion protocol scan. Subjects would then be on either a low or high carbohydrate diet for 36 hours. Uh, subjects would then arrive back on, the, on day three, have a subsequent ultrasound scan and muscle biopsy. So this methodology allowed us to assess in, in, a fl in fluid match conditions whereby uh, fluid intake was not altered between high and low conditions. It allowed us to assess whether the ultrasound technique could could detect glycogen in high and low glycogen availability in arrested muscle. Now the results showed that as we would expect that in high and low conditions we had a significant difference in muscle glycogen availability. Within this study we also measured muscle water content due to the association with the technique and its association with glycogen. That showed no difference between no significant between conditions. And unfortunately, in arrested muscle, we were also unable to see any differences between the high and low conditions, giving basically exactly the same score. So following that, the conclusions of, this, of that paper were that in states of low and high carbohydrate availability, the ultrasound scan was unable to detect changes. And even with its association with water, it also displayed no differences. So even in arrested in arrested muscle, where it was matched for water content and it's matched for fluid intake in absolute glycogen in absolute glycogen concentrations that were different to around 250 millimoles, the ultrasound scoring system was not able to provide a valid assessment of muscle glycogen status. Now following that, and we take it into the field and utilizing the notion of research to practice, what did what did our what did this paper show and what did it it highlight? Highlights that. Unfortunately, the ultrasound method is unable to assess non-invasively muscle glycogen utilization. And if we are going to assess the utilization of, of, of muscle glycogen within athletes, currently, traditional methods such as a muscle biopsy should therefore be used. All right, so all the panelists should have access to a microphone if it, if it works or not. Uh, if you feel free to ask Harry any questions, I've got, just to give people a little bit of an understanding how how we come up with this question and how we, how we decide on this paper. It actually, it was a little you know, WhatsApp message for, for Harry because I noticed the study came out a couple of weeks ago with that uh, did a similar test, but on footballers uh, out in the US. And they found that, that it was, the ultrasound was actually susceptible to, actually susceptible to, to noticing the differences in muscle glycogen. Now, when we actually read through that study and looked at it, there's a lot better internal and external validity in Harry's study than there was in 
he was in this one. Um, if Harry wants to speak a little bit more about that now, then that's fine. Yeah, um, I, like we discussed, that paper has come out recently. Um, it's an interesting one, but the design isn't, is like you say, is different to ours in, in, the, in the sense that it follows a very similar trend to the previous papers about looking at acute changes. And we did see acute changes within our study from pre and post the actual uh, depletion protocol. But re referring to the study that's just come out in, from MLS, and it was in soccer players, even when you look at some of the data they're, they're providing, some players may have gone from a score of 80 to 75. Now, having used the software, that's not a, it's not enough of a change to say that, it, that it's definitely different. There is, there is an element of, of scanner error in there, which you could argue is a score of five. Taking that further, within that paper, it was, it's difficult to ascertain whether what players did from an external low perspective. So even though they've seen, that, they've seen a, a change in glycogen score, it's hard to know whether the play was a sub or not, whether knowing where muscle sound is based and you can put two and two together and figure out where, the, where, they've, done the, where they've done the research. It's, it's in a climate where you could argue players have undertaken no external load and they've simply been sat on the bench as an example, then that decrease could, could arguably be just hydration status. Yeah. So it's difficult to ascertain whether this is in a true decrease in muscle glycogen per se um, when you've got no understanding of the external load parameters or the external load that the individuals have gone through within that study. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Well, um, does anyone else have any questions who's on the panel? No, I've got, I've got a couple more, Harry. Um, so obviously the first thing that, one of the first things after I read the methodology was, you know, there's, there's effectively three studies in one here. Yeah. Now I was wondering, was the same machine used in, in when you were looking at the, all the different three studies or was that a different machine at different sites? I don't, this is me. I, I've never seen this machine before, the ultrasound yeah. machine. So I, I don't really, I don't really know what it was looking like. It was just something yeah, quite so that happened, came to mind. On the first slide, you can see the machine in the image. Um, it's, it's literally the size of a, yeah. of a Mac laptop. So yeah. it, the, the same one was used across all studies. It's portable in nature. I was, a, I was the scanner. So from, from that aspect, it was the same across. So there was no chance of it being used a different machine, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Fine. And, and obviously with any calibration or stuff like that, it doesn't need to be done or is it calibrated when it turns on? How does that yeah, work? It's, it self calibrates itself. Okay, fine. Um, how come in the, in the cycling study, how come there was no biopsies alongside so the ultrasound? Yeah, again, with all these studies, we know, you know how sometimes you can be affected by, by the ability to have money available to do these things. Um, we definitely felt that having the ability to assess the muscle glycogen state in arrested muscle as opposed to acutely. Yeah. Now in hindsight, if, if we had that acute, that acute biopsy following the, the depletion, yeah. that would have obviously really bulked out the study even further and potentially answer some questions from the previous research. Yeah. Um, that was my thinking, obviously the, the glycogen, the glycogen actually changed when in the depletion protocol when you're on the bike, but then nothing changed in the rugby game. So I'm wondering if it's so, cause it's isolated. There's no, Real contact, physical contact with the um, with the muscles during a game. I'm wondering if it could be an option for endurance sports. Yeah, again, well, that would have. What should I say? Yeah, taking that a bit further though, if you and to your point, yeah, that's that's not that's not wrong in in thinking that. But if if you've got a, a rested muscle, which you would have pre any sort of event. In, from an endurance aspect, if it's not able to detect differences between high and low muscle glycogen availability in that rested muscle, regardless of the nature of exercise, yeah. If you if you can't get the initial the initial data points to, to show that you are in a state of high glycogen availability, 
it, yeah. it, it, it's it's difficult to to say that it's it's worthwhile from from that aspect. Good. And then, where do you see any future research going with this? Like, obviously, this paper came out with the MLS, and that's sort of the next the next thing, but probably not quite as ecologically rigid as yours would be. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say because I, d I do think that I've, there is there's, there's something there in the ability of measuring muscle architecture for ultrasound. Yeah. But I don't think there's the ultrasound is is the right method for assessing muscle glycogen, purely from the fact that there's too many things that affect the methodology of me of measuring that muscle water content per se. So because you've got so many different aspects that can influence that. I'm not sure that ultrasound is the right technique. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult to say where, where you can take it because unfortunately we've, we've, sh we've shown that it's not able to detect differences within arrested muscle in states of high and low carbohydrate availability, which you'd assume it will be able to do if it's going to be applicable in, in the applied setting. Okay then, mate. Has anyone else got any any questions? Yeah, I've got one final one, Liam. If that's okay. Yeah, that's fine, pal. Harry, what are the um, so is this predominantly all done in males? These studies. Are you, is it my, you talking of the, my study or the previous work? Your your studies, well, so, all, all I suppose. Yeah. So in our in our validity study, it was a a. a collection of males and females. However, in the uh, biopsy and the rugby league study, it was males only. Give, given the changes that we, we know that occurred in females, particularly over the menstrual cycle, do you think that this would be even more convoluted in that population than it would in just the males, as you found? Yeah, and also, as we know, with, with how the muscle sound works in terms of cropping the image of the muscle only, now, if you've got the the image that it's that it's assessing and it's a cropped it's a cropped image and it's eliminated adipose tissue we know that females will as a generalization will have more adipose tissue around the the quad for instance so it's it the how the the system works is making its window of measurement even smaller taking into consideration also then the menstrual cycle as well you've got so many external factors that are influencing that image and again, to your point, Carl, I don't think it's got the ability to measure measure females, especially with when you've got so many additional influences on that image set. And then fan, final point from me, Harry, if that's all right, because I know we had a conversation about this. Um, that, that new paper obviously made comments about the amount of muscle that you've compared in regards to the assessment with ultrasound. Do you want to make yeah. a, a comment on that to kind of... So to give a rebuttal. Yeah, so in, in that paper, they've said that we, we don't measure whole muscle. Now, the, the, how the ultrasound works is it takes an image at, a, at the, the site of the probe. So the, the probe will give you a depth of whatever it may be, eight centimeters, for example. And it's only giving you a snapshot of that, of that muscle site. So I don't know how... <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure how they're gonna, how they can suggest that it's it's not it's measuring whole muscle when the ultrasound technique itself is only measuring at a certain landmark, as we've shown in our study. Taking that step further, how you biopsy a whole muscle without taking that whole muscle out of a subject, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you can suggest that that a muscle biopsy is not whole muscle. Granted, you not you can't say exactly if it's coming from a type one, type two muscle fiber. That's that's granted, but to say that it's a, it's not a, a, a data point of, of a whole muscle. I'm not sure how you can make that suggestion without taking out someone's whole quad. Really? Is that everything? It's that's it, mate, for me. Okay, brilliant. So, okay, guys. So next up, we've got Kevin Shattuck who's got his paper on auto-regulation. Thank, thank you very much for that, Harry, by the way. That was brilliant. Uh, we've got Kevin Shatoff, whose paper's on auto-regulation in resistance training. 
Now, this is part of his master's research, and he's Kevin's now going on to do his um, his professional doctorate working at Harrogate Rugby, and he's going to continue this research a little bit further, especially something that I've had the conversations with him, how he's going to change that based on this research as well. Thanks, and to echo Har you, Liam, uh, for organising this. I think it's a, an excellent way to, to spend 90 minutes during these difficult times to try and continue everyone's learning. So what I'm going to look at for the next 10 minutes or so is something called auto-regulation. So if you think about planning or periodization for developing athletes, there are a number of variables that the SNC coach can look at. And how you structure your program will kind of dictate how these things interact with each other and flow. But it's widely acknowledged that intensity is one of the key variables to try and enhance levels of strength within your athletes. So how would you go about developing that um, focus within your, within your planning? Most people will have come across a traditional or a percentage-based methodology where you test someone and you generally will do a, a one rep max or a three rep max or a five rep max. And from there, you will then program a percentage of that to facilitate the physiological adaptation that you want, whether it's strength, power, which I break down into strength, speed and speed strength. That process and that methodology is well documented and it's certainly one that I've used in the past um, and, and still dip into every now and again. However, it does have its limitations. For example, I work within Rugby Union and I may well have 40 people or 40 individuals within a squad that I wouldn't need to test. Imagine trying to get 40 people through uh, let's say three tests we do a lower body an upper body push and upper body pull that's going to take a lot of time and I'm going to be able to justify that to my director of rugby or, or head coach that I need one or two hours to do that it's going to be a difficult sell also if you think about it you're only ever going to test a certain number of exercises a squat a bench press uh, a pull you're obviously going to program a wide variety of exercises. So how can you be sure the intensity you're prescribing for those exercises that you haven't tested for is at the correct intensity? Another thing to consider as well is the day-to-day -day fluctuations of an athlete's performance. And obviously, you would like to see some progression over your music cycle, so what I prescribe at 80% on day one, you would like to think the athlete would get better. So by the end of week two, week three, week four, that percentage will have changed because hopefully their strength levels have changed. So there's a number of, of limitations with percentage-based methodology. And one of the alternative methods is auto-regulation. So what is auto-regulation? It can be broken down into subjective or objective methods. Subjective methods, many of the people listening today will have come across them. The, the most well-known is rate of perceived exertion. You can do that for exercise to exercise. You can do it based purely on the session. And you can also do what they call differential RPE. So, for example, if you're in pre-season and your athletes had two training sessions a day, you could look at the different aspects of that training day and pull it all together. Obviously, that relies on an individual's perception of how hard they're working. So what I consider to be a six someone else might consider it to be a seven or an eight and so on and so on. Objective methodology is very much velocity-based training, VBT, 
where you're given an objective score or threshold to try and work towards and keep within. So there's the two, the two methods that you can use. On the left-hand side is RPE or RIR, repetitions in reserve. And then on the right-hand side is the threshold to show you what VBT is about. So if you look at RPE and RIR, you can see there that what my definition or description is might be slightly different from my athletes. So how do I quantify what a 10 is on an RPE? How do I quantify what a one is on RIR? I can give some words, some descriptors, but again, it's down to that individual perception of how hard they're working. When we look at VBT, we're given a, a range or a threshold to work in. So if the bar or the load is moving too fast, we can then increase the weight to then bring it down into that threshold because there is a, a linear relationship between load and velocity. If they're moving too slow, then we can take weight off to get them within that range. And again, this, the same would apply for the, the RPE. I could say, right, I want you to work at an eight. And if someone's put a lot of weight on the bar and they finish the set and say, I'm at a 10, then you would take some weight off. So hopefully you can see there, you can adjust day-to-day -day performance and you can be proactive in how you prescribe load intensity for exercises. So given a working example, my athletes play on a Saturday. They will generally have Sunday off. Monday is a recovery. Tuesday will then look at what we can do physically. If that game on a Saturday has been uh, very physical, it's been a forward-orientated game, then the forwards may well come in, still be under-recovered, still tired. We can then prescribe them or adjust their training to suit their recovery status. If the backs haven't done that much, then they can maybe have a, a normal session. So it just allows to be proactive and react to each individual's training status. So how did we go about testing what might be the more effective method? So we had two groups, 10 people in each group, and they'd undertake six weeks of training and then they'd swap over to the different methodology. So we tested the athletes. We had power, which was a counter movement jump. We had strength, which was a back squat, a bench press and chins. And then we had speed, 10, 20, 40 meters. So we tested everyone first. They then completed six weeks of a methodology, either VBT or RPE. We tested them again. The second week, uh, sorry, the second block of six week training, they swapped groups. And then we tested at the end. And these are the results that we got from each one. Looking at the group mean percentage change and the standard deviation. So again, you can see quite quickly the differences between the two methodologies and how improvements were made. I'd, I'd say the, the anomaly in those results is that the strength, the upper body pull, the chin exercise, if someone does one or two more chins than they did in the previous test, that's quite a lot of percentage change. That's why that stands out quite a lot. On the results there. So the results in graphical form, again counter movement jump, you can see generally for RPE there's roughly a, a kind of five, three to five percent change there. VBT there's obviously an increase. Same for squat and bench press and again you can see one or two outliers there with um, highly different scores between the methodologies. And obviously for the speed testing, we're looking at time, so reduction in time, so we're looking for that minus percentage to be an effective methodology. So what can we draw from that research? 
So both approaches produce positive results and it would be an effective method to introduce auto-regulation into your programming. VBT produced larger and more certain improvements, definitely within strength and power. And it is a demonstrable viable option to percentage-based training. So if you want to make the switch, you know, it, it's comparable, if not better, to percentage-based training. The way we designed the study reduced the effect of any variability in the groups. However, it would have been nice to have both groups complete um, the strength focus and then the speed, uh, strength speed focus as well. But because it was an applied setting, I only had 12 weeks to work with these athletes during pre-season before they actually got into the competitive nature. So unfortunately, that, that time constraint didn't allow me to expand the study and really kind of draw some full conclusions from that. So again, how could you apply it? So again, auto-regulation is effective if you want to enhance strength and power. If you do have the ability to introduce objective auto-regulation, as in velocity-based training, in this study, it produced greater gains. So that is preferable if you can. So again, I know we'll now go on to um, a little bit of a, a discussion. So if you've got any questions, that would be great. Thanks, Kev. I'll get all the panellists now on muted, mate. So if they want to... Hi, Kevin. Hi, how are you? Thank you for your presentation and congratulations for your beautiful paper. Thank really you. Interesting. Um, I, I didn't know uh, the auto-regulation uh, before, so I, I just want to ask you um, that you show really well the limitation of the 1RM method. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand if it already exists a study that has already compared this new periodization with the traditional one. Uh, yes, I believe, um, if I get my papers correct, I think it was Durrell who's done a, a comparison between um, VBT and percentage-based training. Um, so I think it, it's been established that that there is improvements to be made and that methodology did prove in, in that scenario to be a little bit better than the percentage-based methods. Okay, okay, thank you. And just a, a more practical uh, question. How mm -hmm. do you uh, establish the ideal velocity range of a given exercise? So, I think, um, I think man has done some research and there's some normative data. I probably should have put it on the screen to, to show you that. Um, I'll probably put it on, on Twitter a little bit later. That whichever method you use, you can compare and contrast. So 100% of percentage, or sorry, 100% of uh, one RM will translate to 10 on an RPE scale, zero on RIR, and then a lower body upper body pull, upper body push. So that there's certain ranges for lower body exercises, upper body push, upper body pull, um, depending on which physiological component you want to look at and what percentage that translates to. I believe Tim Suchamel, a researcher in America, is currently looking at do individual exercises differ? Uh, but at the minute, it's lower body, upper body push, upper body pull, and they'll have ranges that are comparable to certain uh, percentage. So if you want to work at 90%, it will be this range. If you want to work at 60%, it will be this velocity that you're looking at. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Just a um, quick one for me. Jane, uh, James Redden is in the, he's put in the question and answer. James, you are actually unmuted if you want to ask that question. Now, mate, you can. If not, then I'll yeah, no, no, it's you. fine. Yeah. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to jump in. Um, no in problem. <laughs> oh, Kevin. Hi, thanks for that. It was really good. 
Um, I was just wondering practically how the AR works um, in a team, if you've got a team and, and, and you've got to make the adjustments and you might have limited equipment, the, the, the issues you come across with that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Again, because you're looking to respond on an individual level, then it, it does take some a little bit of kind of trial and error to begin with. Number one, if you're using subjective methods, you're getting used to athletes comparing those methodologies. So what does 90% look like in RPE or RIR? So again, that takes a little bit of playing around with. And then for the velocity-based training, it's getting used to having a bit of technology there, putting some information in and responding to that feedback. So what we did before the study is we had a weak familiarization with each of the methods just to try and get athletes to understand what we were looking for and what they were interpreting from each one. So I'd say if you're looking to, to implement it, I, I would say have both methods up. So let's just say you've got a session on a whiteboard in a gym, five sets, five reps at 85% equals eight RPE or something like that. So you're using both methods to begin with and then slowly reduce one of the methods, for example, the percentage-based training. So athletes can kind of say, all right, 85%, it looks, it feels like this, that's an eight for me, that's a seven for me, and so on and so on. For the VBT, it's a little bit easier because they're, they're looking for tangible figures. They're looking for, I need to work 0 0.5 to 0 0.65, and they're going to get that feedback very quickly. Does that make yeah, sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And just with experience, they're, they're pretty good at picking their weight that that relates to those RPEs or, or that, that velocity. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's one of the, the things you, you could argue. It, it is subjective, as it says, and it's down to that athlete's perception. So if you have, let's say, a novice athlete, they might not be as good as understanding that, that differentiation, that those fine margins of what's a seven, what's an eight, and how are they different where an experienced athlete is going to be quite certain in like, yeah, that's an eight for me, that's a 10 for me. So again, it, it is, for me, it's, this is where the coaching part of it lies, being able to interact with your athletes and kind of say, right, how did that feel? I thought, you know, if I'm watching an athlete, are they moving the, the way I want them to move at the kind of speed I would suggest or think they should be moving after that um, load and, and kind of having that discussion with them to try and draw out where they are physically. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. And that sort of leads on to my question, uh, Kev. And it's something, as soon as we've read the methods of the study, I sort of thought, how, how are you going to apply that to football? And now every team is different you've got different cultures in each team um, and different sports as well so you're not just rugby you're going from individual sports to team sports mm -hmm. um, so within my team i've got probably some people that would prefer to probably take it easy yep. in the gym because they're naturally gifted athletes and they want to basically just play football but then some some players within the team actually really value the benefit of strength conditioning yeah now Sort of, how would you sort of try to integrate that within a new sport, which isn't really used to water regulation? Really, obviously, you've mentioned that putting it on the whiteboard and things like that. But if, if for example, getting someone, would you have to probably like man mark them in the gym a little bit, or would you sort of leave them down to their own, or try to put them in the velocity-based training group, or is what? Yeah, Let's be honest, as much as an S&C coach, I, I would love all my athletes to, to love uh, strength training and, and make them all Olympic weightlifters. But I'm well yeah. aware that they are good at what they do. They enjoy playing the sport, not lifting weights. Some people enjoy the training side of it. Great. Some people know I'm here to play sport. So again, it, it's down to you as a coach, reading your athlete, knowing your athlete. I think the, the velocity-based training allows you 
within a, a training and culture environment to introduce some form of peer regulation. So if your peers are seeing what you're lifting and seeing the scores that you're producing, and again, if you can link in the technology to a, a big kind of TV or screen that has, you know, yeah. station one, athlete A, you're lifting here, athlete B, you're lifting at the speed. Yeah. You know, athletes are competitive. They're then yeah. going to bring that into the, the training scenario. And, you know, they, they don't want to be shown up. So I think that allows a little bit of competition, which is a, a good thing. And again, if you can track an athlete's performance day in, day out. So for example, on a Monday, you can see they were lifting at 0.5. On a Tuesday, you can see they were lifting at 0.8, et cetera, et cetera. You can sort of build up a picture of where they are and you can then start to draw out, are they pulling the wool over your eyes or are they actually having an off day or yeah. how, how can you improve them better? So it, it gives you just an, another tool within a, a wide range of tools on a, or in your toolbox to to work with our athlete and hopefully improve their performance that's brilliant and then just one more from me was could you could you have made the i know it's probably it, it takes away the what actually velocity based training is and using the push because that's you actually get the feedback from it mm -hmm. but could you actually make that blind so they don't actually get any feedback to see if that is actually the same or not i, I think that's a really good point and and possibly um, a future study looking at, um, you know, that, that's really going to show if the methodology is holding true as the, to the way I think it does. But yeah, I think that would be a, an excellent way to, to validate the methods of, you know, actually seeing or getting that um, feedback loop. You know, you're lifting at the right intensity. And again, a, a sports psychologist could maybe use that study to kind of, look at motivation etc etc uh to do with training well that's it for me does any of the other panelists have any questions i i've got one of i can jump in liam if that's okay yeah sure Carl, no problem yeah uh, kevin thanks for that presentation mate that was absolutely brilliant um paper's great presentation was great really highlighting some useful stuff in the field um I've got to admit, first question, I'm, I'm shoehorning in from a colleague at uh, LJMU, Dr. Dave Clark, um, and he's just asked me to ask you, do you know if there's any evidence uh, compared in auto-regulated sets versus, say, sets prescribed by percentage 1RM or RM that have assessed um, the neural inference of what's going on between those two? And if so, um, what are the training statuses of the individuals who have been tested? Uh, I think there's one or two studies at the minute that have looked at kinetic and uh, kinematic variables. Um, but I, I don't think there's... Yeah, I think what Dave's driving at is probably EMG. Has someone looked at any kind of like maybe EMG within specific, you know, muscle groups and looked at what's, what's actually going on between the differences? I think he's just trying, trying to potentially highlight the point. Is it, is it down to the fact that the auto regulation might have a drive on that system, or do you know? Do you think that that, that might be a case? Uh, it'd certainly be something to look at and a very interesting angle to use. I think most SNC coaches would hope that whenever you're undertaking strength training, you're looking at that maximal voluntary contraction, um, and I think that's something the the velocity-based training does really well. It, it it highlights that maximal intent. So whether or not that then changes the kind of EMG side of it, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But I think certainly would fully uh, back up any claims from a VBT side saying that is what it's doing, for sure. Yeah, spot on. Thanks, mate. And then final one from me. Um, just looking in terms of the design, Design, um, and this isn't a comment that the study is great as it is. Do you think, and obviously this isn't practical from an e ecological validity standpoint, do you think if there was a larger washout between the two blocks, you might see any differences between the subjective and the objective, or do you think it wouldn't make any difference regardless of that? I, 
think, as, as you've said, that would probably add more validity to it. I, I personally don't think you would see a difference if there was a, a greater washout. Um, I think athletes, or certainly athletes I work with, are kind of used to training, used to going from there. So personally, I don't think there would be. But again, it's another angle that you can look at to really support whichever argument you're looking to make. So I think it's a good point. Yeah. Thanks for that, mate. Great study. Thanks for the presentation. Cheers, Carl. Right, is that everything from all the panellists? Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Kev. That was brilliant. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. And I think it's really practical that we can... Some people can actually take back to clubs and sort of use and change, maybe change things up a little bit or even, you know, test for themselves within their own athletes how that actually works. So yeah, yeah, hopefully. That, that, I think it's a really good applied, uh, applied study. Yeah, well, that, that's why I'm, I'm trying to kind of be an applied researcher is what can I contribute and, and hopefully people can take something away from that. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, brilliant. Right then, James Kev, just... Now we'll move on to Professor Barry Drust. Now Barry's, I've known Barry now for probably over 10 years, if I actually think all the way back, which is ast astounding really. <laughs> Barry's, Barry's currently uh, a professor at University of Birmingham, and he has obviously published a large amount of research in the field. And he's going to be discussing a paper by Chris Carlin, who's actually one of the panelists today, who can obviously get in with discussions at the end of this, at the end of this presentation. And Barry's going to be, Barry's going to be going through the paper probably in a little bit of a different way than what the last two presenters have. So I'll pass it over to you now, Baz. Can Thank you hear me, Baz? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'll just yeah. see if I can start my screen then. Let me stop sharing mine. So, so it, it's, it's really great to see, um, I guess people like Liam trying to be innovative and, and create um, new ways to contribute to the field. Um, and when he kind of suggested to me that he wanted to do a journal club, um, I suppose one part of a journal club in, in my experience is actually kind of people talking about research papers um, that aren't theirs. Um, I guess to try and talk about some of the key issues around research design and, and things that we can think about when we read other people's research. So, so today really, um, my view was to, I guess, kind of work on a topical paper that, that Liam chose that, that is going to be really important over the next few months for especially people who work in football and, and to just talk a little bit about the research. So it's important to let everybody know uh, at the start that I mean, these are my views, right? Um, they're not facts, so it's only my interpretation of the paper. But to, to start off with, Liam said, you know, work in 10 minutes, and that really isn't long to kind of discuss the complexities of a research article. So this will be a little bit of a kind of top line in, in some of the things that we might want to think about. And, and it's not really my job to, um, I guess, knock uh, anyone's research. I mean, having been involved in the processes around publication with a number of students over a number of years all published papers have merit I mean it's a really difficult thing to get your research published in a peer-reviewed journal and so I think if we accept that everything's got some merit that's in this kind of forum then the key really is to understand that merit not to just pull it to pieces you know, it is easy to be critical and, and it would be easy um, to, to knock anybody's work. Um, but the idea here really is to get you to think about your process, about how you read papers, not, not necessarily to just do a hatchet job on, on work that was done by um, Chris and Greg and, and other authors a few years ago. All right, so when I'm kind of looking at papers then, I suppose, what's my starting point? Well, m most of us read papers, I guess, because we're interested in them. And so my first step is always, okay, well, what does this paper tell me? You know, what, what is the new knowledge that I might be looking 
to take from this, this research article. And then what else then is important really is, is well, what's the basis of these conclusions? Um, and so for me, that really comes down to two really pragmatic kind of approaches. I mean, what's the research question that the person's asking? And then what's the approach to answering this research question? So i.e. What, what does the methodology look like? And so often in a paper, um, the first thing that I'll read is the methodology uh, because the methodology really helps me navigate, I guess, the, the, the kind of self rating of quality that I have in my head and, and how much I can kind of take from the information that the paper has. So really I'm looking for the match, you know, how, how clear is the research question? How good is the research question? And then do I think then that what the authors have done have tried to answer the research question in an effective way? So, so let's think about this paper then really, um, and, and how this paper can be viewed from my point of view in relation to these two areas. Well, well, let's start by the research question then. And, and the real positive, I think, for this paper is that, well, it's a practical research question, right? I mean, there isn't anybody who's been involved in football or other sports, I guess, that have kind of competitive schedules where people haven't thought about the implications of, of tightly congested games. And if these tightly congested games do impact on an athlete's ability to perform, so, so it's a really important pre practical question to try and answer. But, but from a scientific point of view, I mean, it's a real challenging question in that it's big and complex. So what do I mean by big and complex? Well, let's think about the concepts that the paper's really trying to address. Um, they're really difficult concepts. So in the introduction, it talks about residual fatigue well, what is residual fatigue? I mean, fatigue is kind of one of these terms that um, is thrown around by everybody, but is probably used in probably a million different contexts. I mean, is this the, are we talking about, about fatigue that we'd expect to see after a game that recovers in a given time period? Are we talking about fatigue that happens over the consequence of a season of playing multiple games? It's a really complicated thing to try and understand. And, and that's also similar for football performance. Um, you know, I would, I would love at times to work in a sport which is determined by the clock, because then it's very easy in some ways to understand how we may go about making athletes better. But when we've got um, a very complicated performance model that's got lots of individual attributes, but actually success is down to how those individual attributes are kind of um, linked together by the overall team function. It becomes very difficult then to understand performance and, and how we actually really may operationalize performance. So this is a very difficult question to answer and, uh, and I really applaud the authors for trying to answer it. And, and probably when we've got questions of this nature, one paper is never going to provide the information that we need. We're probably only going to really understand this by doing a whole kind of range of research studies, some of which are very applied like this one is, but some maybe which are also quite controlled and focused on maybe looking at more detailed physiology that might be relevant to this area. So, so, so they, they took on a hard job right from the off. Um, Let's then think of the methodology and, and really, I guess the methodology and the choice of methodology always links back to the question. And so when you've got a very complex question, inherently then it's gonna be very difficult to create a simple and effective methodology to answer that question. And, and that's probably a consequence of, of this issue of signal and noise. And, and my view is really is that if you're trying to think about effective research design. I mean, all of your choices should be about trying to maximize the signal and, and minimize the noise. So, so what do I mean in this situation? Well, well, the signal really, I guess, is 
the changes in performance that we would that we would see as a consequence of the congested fixture period whereas the noise is the the potential impact of lots of other variables which could be changing the way those players perform over those games which is not linked to the fixture scheduling so so when i try and think about that then again in the context of this paper you know some things kind of jump out in terms of things to think about you know we, we don't really know how this kind of research question was um, arrived at by the authors so you know i suspect it was probably a retrospective study where they had existing data the team had already played these games and so there was some desire to see actually if if this provided an opportunity and when you do retrospective research, I guess, instead of prospective research, then it's very difficult in some cases to control key variables or maybe take some of the measurements that you might think later on are important. Um, at every applied study, especially applied studies around football games, have, have high noise um, and mainly around, I guess, the variability of performance. And when you do things in the real world, then you also have a lack of control so, so whether they actually undermine the findings of this study or whether they just kind of add context to the findings of this study and and things i guess people can decide themselves and then we've got things like outcome measures i guess i guess the outcome measures that are used here um are quite broad you know but maybe there, there are other outcome measures that could have been important like for example, compliance with the recovery interventions and the amount of training that uh, the team also did around these fixtures, because maybe they would help us explain why we see what we see, not, not just then enable us to just focus on the description of any changes we might see in the performance. Now, the authors, I think, actually do a really good job in discussing this paper and talking about their limitations. And that made me start to think about, well, are some of the things that we see in research papers a consequence of um, the science or are they just a function of the challenge of publication? So, so anybody who has kind of published a peer reviewed paper right, knows that the journal actually provides constraints on, on what the authors do. So, for example, the, the publication bias around papers with positive findings is well known. And so, for sure, as an author, then, if you're trying to get your work into a peer reviewed journal, I mean, you're definitely rewarded at times for, for making studies potentially seem more exciting than they actually are. You know, there are also quite strict word counts. Um, and so again, you know, at times then that maybe prevents authors adding in additional context around the orientation of the research question or actually kind of giving important details around the methodology. And so what I would just say is, you know, sometimes research papers are a reflection of what the authors did, you know, sometimes maybe the publication game doesn't reward best practice. And so maybe then when we're reviewing papers and thinking about how important they are for us, we don't see all of the information that we need because of the constraints that journals um, place on us. So then if I'm gonna conclude then, for me then, when I'm really evaluating what I guess I would call research quality, though I'm not sure quality is the right word. My, my approach really is to look at the match between the research question and the approach. Does the way the authors have tried to answer the question make sense to me from my experience, I guess, of designing my own research studies? It, it's really hard to answer um, complex questions in real world situations. And we should definitely try and do that. And anybody who tries to do that, in my mind, should be commended. But, but we might also need to understand that that isn't the only approach we need to research. And so actually having a variety of different types of experimental design and different approaches to answering questions could be important for us to really understand what's going on. And then 
always just think about about the other external influences that might have influenced how a paper looks and sometimes it may not be the author's fault that some things maybe have not been clearly communicated maybe the publication process doesn't always permit us best practice in reporting but what we found and why so i think that's all i've got for you liam but hopefully that's been a, a bit of a of a useful insight into my approach around these things and has provided a platform to kick off the conversation around this topic area. That was brilliant, Baz. I think it's this is part of the reason why I wanted to start this as well, because obviously we've had at the minute we've had you know Harry who's finished his academic process, he's an applied practitioner. Kevin, who's just about to start his academic process, but he is as well as an academic pr uh, practitioner an applied practitioner and then there's you who you know you've got a vast experience within the applied field but you're also a well-established academic as well so i think it just comes across of how how different people and people from different um communities really sort of look differently at research i think it's brilliant the fact that you've gone through that process to see like how you actually go through a research paper and what actually comes to your mind when you read it compared to what comes to most yeah, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I've done an exercise actually with a with a very recent PhD student, and I've started doing this process with students early on, just to compare how we approach it. And it's really clear, actually, that that there is a lot of people who read research just to gain knowledge, not necessarily to think about the quality of that knowledge. Yeah. So, so understanding both, I think, is is maybe important for people to think because. Not, not everything that is written is true, um, that, that's for sure. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to meet, unmute all the panellists now, so if people don't want to be heard, then please, um, please mute yourself, if that's okay. And then we'll kick off some questions. Has anyone got any questions for Barry? Hi Barry, just Kevin. Uh, again, thanks for that presentation. I thought you highlighted the, some of the issues really well. Um, and, and given I'm, I'm starting this experience, a, a valuable talk for me. Could you just maybe talk a little bit more about that best practice not being rewarded and, and how we could change that so someone reading a journal recognizes rather than pulls apart a methodology and, and uses it for their own how can we start to implement that's best practice we should go ahead and use that um i mean i'm sure i'll try i mean i, I guess there's two things i'll say i mean i think i think more and more now um journals are kind of expanding um the information that the authors can upload so you know like some journals now encourage people for example to submit the data or supplementary files so so i guess people are aware in some cases about about constraints of the printed page mm -hmm. um the other thing maybe to think about is that um you know when you think about disseminating your research you know m maybe maybe there are different ways now to think about dissemination and so for sure you know you probably have got to do different things to reach different audiences so you know there might be ideas around kind of like short and long form communication mm -hmm. so for example you know you um you know you may be able to kind of just like give like really short detail around your paper on twitter or linkedin you know you then may have the peer publication and then if you're not contravening copyright of the journal, you know, maybe there are ways to write blogs around your research or, or give other information really about, about your process of collecting the data, which other people might find interesting to read, but again, may not necessarily fit under the banner of a peer reviewed journal. So the mm -hmm. great thing about, um, I guess the internet and, and different dissemination means is that, you know more than ever actually as an individual you've got control over that and i guess as long as you're not infringing copyright um of, of replication of information then 
actually there's probably lots of ways you can kind of layer in different messages to your readership to understand some of those issues. That's great, thanks for that. That's a really good answer, thank you. Hi Barry, it's Chris here. How's it going, mate? Hi Chris, you right? Yeah, how's things? Yeah, no, I can't complain, mate. Good, good, good. A couple of questions for you, Barry. Um, I'm just wondering what your opinion is, um, and you mentioned it briefly about the, the paper um, which we wrote a few years ago um, about perspective and retrospective. Th this, this paper was a bit of both, really. I mean, the data was prospectively collected, analysed, game to game, and then published retrospectively. Um, do you think that there's too, there are too many papers, and I think, you know, I could be you know, I could be guilty of it myself, doing retrospective analysis, getting a data set, convenience data, analysing and publishing it. Do you think that's an issue? Um, look, I mean, I guess the, the big difference, I guess, Chris, in the last 10 years or so maybe has been the availability of data. Mm. Um, and, and for sure, um, you know, I think, I think something I talk about a lot really is this issue of can and should. And I'm really guilty of, of sometimes doing things that I can do rather than things that I should do. And I think the availability mm -hmm. of data has definitely made us all think that, that we have got um, good things to kind of put out into, into publication when, when maybe in some ways they're not, they're not as well formed as they could be. I mean, the one thing that I would say is I just think, you know, we probably need it all. You know, we probably need um, people doing um, like like using data because it exists. We need people doing more controlled studies. And again, I think people really um, we should just be probably at times a little bit more honest around why we're doing it and what it's for and how useful it can be. So, for example, you know, a lot of the publication I do now really is to support the experience and the development of young researchers. It's not necessarily because I think that, you know, I'm going to change the way the world thinks about it. Now, does that mean that that's not a good exercise? Well, no. Does it mean for it's a slightly different purpose than informing practice? Well, probably yes. Mm. So, so again, really, I just think um, that this idea of actually just, just being honest about why you're doing something is key. But then I also get that sometimes, you know, as I said, journals don't want that. And that's maybe something that we should be trying to challenge, you know, mm. you know, we should really be focusing on the, the broad range of reasons for publication and maybe having different types of publications, you know, which will better suit some of this work. Okay. Good. And second question, if you don't mind, um, what do you think about, for example, um, Recently, the Journal of Science and Medicine and Football um, is giving an opportunity to submit your uh, study design for validation prior to actually doing the study and, put, and, and submitting it. What do you think about that, that particular approach? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, I think when you say it right, kind of the, the immediate kind of like response it makes you a little bit twitchy, if you know what I mean. But actually, I think if, 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 if you could actually get great feedback and it did improve a study and then you could get some, I guess, like confirmation from the journal that they would publish it irrespective of the outcome, then actually, you know, maybe that again would address some of these issues. Mm, very good, yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think there are, there are lots of challenges, right, around peer review. Uh, and I think there isn't anybody again who hasn't had a paper published who doesn't have frustrations with the system. Um, and for me, I think the more that we open up the dialogue around peer review and, and we try and take back a little bit more control and maybe around peer review from the publishers, that's got to be a good thing. Okay. Thanks, mate. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chris, as well, for that. Um, I don't know if you could potentially answer this, Chris, as well. It's one for, it is one for Barry, but obviously the, the variable which you're looking at, which was measuring performance, was actually match performance. Now, is there, it's one, probably one of the most difficult things to measure within, within professional football, but is there any other variable that you could think of or a supplementary variable that could go with that? Obviously, and Chris has mentioned this to me as well, they won seven out of the eight games that they were actually uh, performing in, so that's a, a big indication that performance was quite high still. 
Uh, yeah, well, we, we did have all, obviously, the technical tactical data, but it was getting back to Barry's point, it was a yeah. word count, it was a word count issue. So, you know, we would have liked to have put the data in, but they, the, if I remember rightly, either the editor or the reviewer said, uh, well, just stick to the injury and the physical data and, and the technical, well, yeah, um, it's a bit too much. And we, we couldn't have fitted it in anyway, because we yeah. were so close to the word, I think we even went over the word count in the end. But funnily enough, I did actually include that in my PhD thesis. So, and, and again, the technical data mirrored um, the physical data in that in the last two or three games, the team actually performed better. So, so they was, yeah, they played, so yeah, so scored more goals and more ball possession and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the team was pretty successful over, over that, that particular set of games, really. So, but yeah, I mean, but it's just, yeah, I mean, it's two different ball games. It's practical reality. Um, what you're supplying to the coach, what you're analysing, and what you want to to actually put into a publication. And again, this was retro. The publication was retrospective. We thought it was worth publishing. Um, we would have liked to. We could have potentially have written just an, another paper on um, just the technical aspect of the eight games. But yeah. you've got to draw the line somewhere. It's just <laughs> dred dredging the same data set over and over again. It's definitely, definitely not. But it's good though, and it's something. So I. I read this paper uh, probably early on last week, really. Obviously, I've read it previous, but like many things, they go to the back of your mind and you, you get them out again when you need them. Um, so I wanted to go over it. And this is it's obviously a really good paper at the minute because it's, I think, what, this nine, nine some teams have 10 games left the season. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the closest that I could find. And then I, I wanted to have a look at what my team have done now. Can everyone see this match fixtures on the screen now? What was it? Ah, okay. Yeah, so Yeah, it's gone now. Yeah, so I wanted to I wanted to look at sort of so what what have crew done this season and now this is literally immediately after the preseason. So there's game one this year. Now we went Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday for four weeks. Now it's nine games in 28 days, and I have to credit uh, Song Mi Kim, who thinks listening in the attendees section. So she she did this work with a part of a study we've got sort of ongoing now at Crew, and we wanted to, I wanted to know okay, so what percentage of them games did our current players play in? Because I think it was a conversation. It's a paper you actually have out, Chris, with the the fact that. You know, because of squad rotation, things like that, not often people actually go through the congested fixture periods. Yeah, I don't think in, in I'm not too sure at Championship or League One or yeah, the two yeah. levels, but I, I mean, I know in the top, top flight, it's the, but again, it all comes, what does it all boil down to? Very few teams play these, these amount of games anyway. So, you know, the top five in the Premier League, top six, Championship, yeah, you play a lot, but. Um, and not many, not many teams are actually confronted to, with, with, with the issue of match congestion, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the COVID, it's going to, a lot of teams will be confronted with something they've never had, it, had, had any experience in before. So, uh, you yeah. know, it's going to be an interesting, an interesting, we've got a project at the French FA, similar, you know, we're going to look at the data in the in League One um, prior to and after previous seasons and to see what's going to actually happen when the players come back, you know, and start playing again. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. And it's definitely a, it's definitely something that I don't think has ever happened before where, where basically every football team in Europe mm. who's on the same sort of season are going to be, have such a confined amount yeah. of games. Such a dense yeah, game. some teams are just, they're just so used to doing it. Uh, you know, it's just part and parcel of the club. It's a culture. So, yeah. you know, and, and yeah, and a lot of clubs have, you know they don't the the old, the old time will play, you know two three games in eight or nine days, but it's not usual. Yeah, and especially the but, fact that you know usually you get a six week six week preseason and probably even at the top level a couple of weeks at the start of the season to try and prepare yeah. for that yeah. um, like dense period of games. But I've 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 reason to believe that the when the Premier League we got we get started again and the Football League will follow suit that. It's going to be a, at maximum a three-week preseason, and then we're going to start games again. 
So that's probably a two-week loading phase, and then you sort of, you know, you're into your normal weekly cycle leading into that game on the Saturday. Liam, one one thing I'd say, just in answer to your question, if I can. Yeah. You know, if we 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 know that the performance is really variable. Yeah. But if we're interested in the con in the impact of congested fixtures, I mean, one thing to potentially look at, like, is the cost. So so. Don't look at what actually the players do in the performance. Just look at what it means for them in terms of the demand. So, for example, like like the post game recovery measures, you know, might be a little less variable. Yeah. And so maybe if we look at the cost and we look at the implications of the game that we have to play, I mean, maybe that is actually a different way to think about the challenge of congested fixture periods not yeah, good point barry good not point. if performance is maintained but actually yeah. what, what is the cost of that performance to the player mm. barry it's chris barnes here um sorry to interrupt that guys but it you just mentioned the variability there and obviously earlier on in the presentation you spoke about this whole concept of signal and noise yeah which is a total nightmare in football because there is absolutely so much noise yeah. I, I mean, I guess my question to you is, and it's, it's a general question, and I would say to both you and to Chris, um, generally speaking, if, with those people who are working in football, whether that is as researchers or applied practitioners, in your experience, do people pay enough attention to actually trying to quantify the noise in the game before they jump to inference and conclusion in terms of what they see in front of them? Uh, I think it's mixed, Chris. I mean, I think I think some don't. I think some do, but but I also just think that what what we've not been very good at really is helping practitioners navigate that challenge. So so inevitably, right when we start to get into, you know, these issues around kind of like like, I guess maximizing um, maximizing the signal, you know, we get into quite quickly, quite complex kind of like statistical issues that like typically we're not very good at communicating to practitioners in my view. So, you know, I think it's mixed, but I'm not sure we as, we as academics in some cases always help people understand what that actually really means and how they can practically orientate it. And saying that, I mean, there's some, there's some really brilliant examples by people like Chris Bishop and Anthony Turner, you know, who've got some fantastic publications on just like creating spreadsheets and doing calculations and things like that. Um, so, so maybe we need to be doing more to help people fill that gap, not, not just um, expecting people to be able to kind of deal with, um, I guess, kind of like quite complex theoretical concepts. Um, I've got a question on the Q and A here. It's probably it's probably good for Barry and Chris. Really, um, it just says, "Do you think the result will be the same uh, if only players play more than 75 percent of total game time were analysed?" I think actually you mentioned in the study, did you, Chris, that not a lot of people played more than that. Is that the, the goalkeeper? No, no, the, the manager ro rotated the. I think if, if I recollect, I think only. Only one player completed all the game, all the games. Yeah. Um, and you'd have, for example, a couple of players playing three in a row, then dropping to the sub bench or maybe getting a little, little niggle, sitting it out. Or so it was, we didn't have continuous data for the for the same players. But yeah, it would be nice for research purposes. But I think for health purposes, if if you know eleven players, the same eleven start every and finish every single game. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not, a good idea. It's not feasible, is it really? It's no, so not really. So, but I mean, plus, you know, you get suspensions as well. Players get. We had a, I think we had a red card as well yeah. in a series of games. So, you know, obviously, one player would have missed missed the game as well. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting research question, and I mean, there's very little. Um, if you you, know, you want to take it from a, a physiological point of view as well, I mean, the only study, to my knowledge, which has looked at uh, the physiological responses over three games, for example, is the Moore study a few years ago. There's no data out there, to my knowledge, which, where we have physiological measures or physical measures, for example, for yeah. five or six games in a row. 
So I'm getting back to Barry's point, which I think is really, really, um, uh, it's, it's, it's pertinent. Is you know, so we're looking at the the post-match recovery kinetics. Um, you know, that would potentially be more interesting, but we don't have any information in the literature on the yeah. effects of playing five or six games in a row. So. So this is a great study there, Liam, for someone to do. When well, we I think that's, that's what's going with the next one, so, yeah. <laughs> just, 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 re just remember where the ideas come from before anybody steals it and publishes it without me. <laughs> um, the only other thing that I had which I found, which I found actually really interesting, and it's probably more from, the, I think there's a few physiotherapists who have signed up for this, um, and obviously how much the days between, when the fixture periods were congested, the days lost to injury was so much fewer. Now, would you think that's because, because there's so many games, the medical department hurry them up, not necessarily too quick, but they, they probably under a lot of pressure to be able to hurry them up, to be back for maybe, yeah, they missed a weekend, but they need to be back for Wednesday, for example. No. Probably going that's out to one, that, That's the one for Chris to answer, I think. Sir, you broke up. I didn't hear. I didn't hear the question. It, it was more to do, Chris, with the so the injuries which were recorded, and obviously compared to the reference team. Or yeah. they, not, or without outside of that period. Now, I think that the, the days to return to play or training was so much fewer when the periods were congested, rather than when there was a week between games. Now, do you yeah. think that's probably the, the pressure which is on the medical department, really, which is uh, it, uh, get that player back for the... Uh, maybe I, I won't answer that. One. You don't want to answer that? No. Okay. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, again, because it's such a small sample and, and the yeah. game, and I think we, we, we had like, hardly any injuries, really. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know, it's just... It's just so hard to, to to answer that question. I mean, and and to be honest as well, it's yeah, you can It's not just the medical staff. The players want to play. If, if the players could play in every game, they'll do it. You know, I think they'll do it because any professional footballer wants to play in every single game. So, so yeah, I, I, I can't really answer the question to be honest. You know, yeah, it comes just, from the play, it comes to the medical staff, it comes to the manager. Yeah, I, I just, staff. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I personally, I've seen it. I've seen it happen um, numerous times, really, where you go through a, like a small congested fixture period of maybe, I don't know, two weeks of six or seven games. And um, you, you, you come out of it, and then it's really the older players where they come to you and say, I've got a little bit of a knock, I won't be training until Thursday. And it's like, you know, but you've just got yourself through six games in 14 days. Mm. And it's like, oh, oh, sorry, five games in 14 games, it'd it, it be, sorry. Um, and it's sort of maybe that subconsciously the players really, when you're going through them periods, yeah, we need a day or two rest. Mm, yeah, I think, I think, you know, as well, it's, it depends if you're on a good run as well. You need to get on a roll. And it's, you know, it's, it's the old adage as well. It's, you know, players when they, you know, they, some players will come back. But if, you, if, if you're winning games, no one's injured, no one's tired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit like that, but it's just human nature, I think. So and that's what that's what we're going to be going into over the coming weeks, aren't we? Because there's things like promotion, relegation, winning yeah. titles, everything yeah. clubs in nine games is like a little World Cup sort of thing. Yeah, and I think the point is as well where this this period coming up is a little bit different now to in season is that you've got a you've got an end goal. So a player might think, oh, I can, I can stick it out. There's you know maybe stick the six or seven of these games out. Uh, I'll be able to do it, and afterwards I know I've got a rest period. Yeah. Whereas then, you know, that period we played in, where we, you know, we had eight or nine games in, in a short period, um, that was just before Christmas. You know, yeah. um, so in season is it is the in season data will, will will it be different to end season data? I don't know. I don't know. It's just but that that potentially will have an impact on the results. Brilliant. Has anyone else got any questions? Anyone from the panel? No, well, I'll just literally discussion. I just want to say thanks, really, to everyone who's got involved. I think it's been brilliant. Everyone's definitely learned something. I've just got, I'd like to thank all the speakers in Barry, Kevin and Harry. Also, performance scientist and Dave Carlan for really helping me out, sort of moral support. 
as we've been going on, and he's promoted it very much on his Twitter page. And also Steve Barrett, because Steve, a couple of weeks ago, put on his webinar. And I think a little bit like this one, it sort of blew up. I wasn't expecting anywhere near enough attendees to come to this. And then also Meg from Playmaker, who's given me enough lessons in Zoom to last me a lifetime. So it's brilliant, the fact that she's, she's took time out of her day to, to do that for me. And it's brilliant that everyone can sort of come together during these times in order to put these sorts of things on. So that's it, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the presenters. And Thanks, thank you to Chris as well for, for the good discussions and your um, input on that discussion then, Chris. No problem. My pleasure, mate. Brilliant. Thank you.